first time I met Ali, it was on September 11th, 2016, in Beijing. Back then, neither of us could speak a word of Mandarin. Now, he writes articles and books in Chinese. Together, we talked about our journey of learning Chinese, the Chinese film industry before COVID, his experiences during the lockdown in China, and how he became a nomadic writer. If you enjoy this content, please drop a few stars in the review section. This is the best way to support the podcast. Okay, great. Uh, so, Ali, the first time we met, uh, I remember that, that date uh, pretty vividly. It's because it was um, September 11th and I had taken the plane uh, on that day. So I, I remember, you know, uh, getting on the plane and, and being a little bit anxious about the idea of, of being on a plane on a September 11th. But I guess probably I, I, had, I had gotten like cheaper tickets or something. <laughs> But um, but then I I landed in Beijing for the first time and I I took a cab from the from the airport to the school, and and then I saw you I saw you and you were the only uh, non Chinese person that I had seen uh, since I landed, and um, and I remember that at this at this time we were in the in the restaurant that was right next to uh, to our dorms that would would become our dorms. And um, and we couldn't speak any Chinese, like none of us could speak any Chinese. Uh, and that was 2016. And now uh, you are writing books in Chinese. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So I was thinking of, yeah, first asking you a little bit about, I think maybe a question that I've never asked you before is, um, originally, what brought you to, to China? My first uh, contact with China, it was in... Uh... August of uh, 2014, I was in university, majoring in communication, and uh, also working part-time as a sports journalist. And uh, part of why I took that job was that I knew that uh, one or two years into it, I would be sent to China for a work trip. And uh, that was kind of exciting to, to know that you... you I had a, a bunch of work trips lined up for uh, for this for this job because it was for a, a very uh, unpopular sport, uh, very very niche sport, uh, the shooting sports. So basically, every time they gather for a for a competition, it's somewhere in the world, some other different place. So they, uh, I was getting to travel a, a lot with it, and uh, I traveled to China for the Youth Olympic Games of 2014 uh, held in Nanjing to cover the shooting sports competitions there. And it was only for one week, but it was uh, different enough to make me feel like I had entered uh, a new world. I mean, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, people ask me about that week because, uh, you know, when I when I went back to write my story, my China story, uh, that's it's kind of an interesting time, the, the very first time you were there. But there, there's, I don't have very uh, specific memories about it, except for almost getting stuck into a temple <laughs> during the night <laughs> for staying there after it closed. And I was, I was um, calling for the guy to open the door and let me out. But uh, other than that, yeah, I, I remember... Just random things, being at a restaurant, having fish and uh, wanting a glass of white wine and just getting a glass of uh, boiling hot water because <laughs> my, my communication skills were, you know, they were what they were. <laughs> so that, that's some, some very random things, also just getting on the subway in Nanjing. But th there was something about it that made this trip feel very ex radically different from all the other trips I was having in Europe, even in Central Asia. Um, it made me feel like, whoa, there's a, there's a whole other world that I know nothing about. So that was in 2014. I was still in university, only one week uh, there in Nanjing. Then I, I got back to Rome. I finished my degree uh, two years after. And... At that point, uh, 
for those two years, I didn't think too much of China, but once it, uh, I, I was I was starting to experiment with film. So I was starting to make some short films. And I, uh, once I graduated, uh, even before graduating, I tried a bunch of different jobs. I had uh, stopped with the sports reporting. Uh, I was trying to find something a bit closer to my, I guess, to more creative maybe. And um, I, I hadn't found it yet. So uh, uh, in that summer of 2016, I decided, well, maybe I, I will do a master's in film because that, that's, that's what was interesting me the most back then. And uh, I was in Rome, just uh, you know, kind of lost as to where to go, what to do. And uh, I, I ran into an article online um, from The Economist about the Chinese film industry and how it was growing a lot, lots of investment, lots of cooperations with the West. Um, qu quite a different scenario compared to now. It, was, it, it looked a lot more optimistic back, back then and a lot more... Uh, I guess in, in harmony with the West, maybe, um, and I, and I thought, well, these things click click together in my mind. This uh, curiosity that I still had about China, this uh, uh, this this place that was still very unknown to me, and uh, the possibility of uh, well, the potential at least uh, of uh, doing something with film that seemed to be something that was growing there. And I thought, well, one plus one, why, why not? Why, why not try to go there uh, long term and uh, le learn film there? And so I, 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 I looked into the uh, Beijing Film Academy and uh, it was, uh, my, de my decision was so last minute that it was actually too late to apply for any program starting it was already July and uh, the program started in September. I couldn't apply. I could only apply for a Chinese language program. Uh, so I applied for that one. And uh, that was probably good in hindsight because it gave me time to observe the life in the school um, and, and in Beijing and in the... Because in, in the beginning, I didn't have the audacity to, audacity to think that I would follow a program, a film program in Chinese. At the beginning, I thought, well, I will just do the international program in English. Uh, but it was too late to apply. And then once I got there and I met you and we we kind of both agreed that we didn't want to do the international program, but instead the local one in Chinese. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a decision that I would have never have made uh, back in Italy. <laughs> it would have sound. I mean, it already sounded a bit crazy when I thought about it in Beijing. When I when, when I learned from you that you were going, you wanted to do it. I, I still couldn't believe it at the beginning. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, once you're in Beijing, I guess it's uh, it's easier to make a, a decision like that. But yeah, so it's these these are the sort of uh, uh, I would say a lot of is. is random and uh, explaining why I came to China is something that I struggled with uh, but r while writing my book because I, I realized that a tendency I have is uh, to look at, to look, to recreate a story from how things happen afterwards. So once you know what happened afterwards, it's easy to make a different story. Um, so I, I, I try to be, I try to be as real as to the facts as possible. And I, I have to be honest and say that the decision to go to China more than a carefully crafted plan was the result of me having just graduated university, being a bit lost, not knowing where to do, where to go, and just following this spark of curiosity for a, a, a different world, uh, trying to do something interesting to me. Yeah. Before we, we move on to like talking more a bit uh, about the Chinese film industry and like your experience being in the in the Chinese program in directing uh, maybe we can uh, linger a bit more on the the learning experience of just being in this Chinese program uh, together because at some point we were sharing the same uh, Chinese classes and um, I <coughs> I know that this question might sound a little bit um, arrogant in in retrospect um, but Here's, here's how, I, how I want to, to formulate it. It's like I know that many people uh, try to learn Chinese and many people um, have this will, you know, to, to try to 
uh, to accumulate the vocabulary to replicate some of the formula that you can you can hear at the beginning and stuff but not so many people actually manage to uh, maybe not master it because it's it's a big world but to actually uh, become fluent enough that you can feel comfortable in the language by you know building relationships maybe writing books and stuff like that so the question i would like to ask you is like what do you think made the difference between uh let's say like a classroom of, of 15 people and 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 a few people like us who kind of managed to to make their way uh, in in mandarin yeah uh, big question because i uh yeah pr probably the the answer is different for for everyone so it's a uh, it's hard, I think, to to find a common a common reason that is uh, that works for everyone. What I what I can what I can say is uh, thinking of you and me. I think we we were both very we invested a lot in our new lives in China, and uh, Chinese was the medium to get to it and to get deeper into this new life we created and to find more opportunities in it, more relationships. And it, it's, I think it's the sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> you invest so much in the language and in uh, your life uh, in, a, in a foreign country, only if, or say the, the degree to which you invest on it, depends on on how much you are uh, uh maybe even cutting away from your past life like a cre almost like creating a, a new self a new identity um yeah i think this is a a point that was probably very attractive for both of us and that gave us the motivation and energy to pursue this uh this language that seemed so so far away at the beginning, I mean, in the first two months of classes, I was not really optimistic that I would learn Chinese. I was like, well, this is one one more random thing, one more random thing I did in my life, but I'm not sure that it will lead anywhere. Uh, but then a, a series of things happened and uh, yeah, things changed. Uh, my relationship with Chinese and with China took a more stable turn. Uh, yeah, so it, if that makes sense, uh, maybe the, our our commitment to our new lives in China. Yeah, yeah, I can I can really relate to what you just said about creating a new new self. Um, the only thing that I I found out about like my my behavior towards Chinese was also that at some point it had become almost like an addiction, which is to say that I was really trying to know all of the characters. And every time I would see a new one, I would be literally like hunting for it and being desperate for knowing the sound of it, knowing the history of it, knowing what was hidden between the, the shapes of the characters and all that stuff. Did you, did you ever feel this kind of like addiction towards, towards Chinese language? Uh, I'm not sure if I would use addiction with such a strong word as addiction, but I would, I would definitely say a sort of a, uh like a natural a natural high something like that uh, uh but I, I i still feel it every now and then because i mean i read in chinese every day uh, as part of my work or just interest uh, for articles whatever um so not not all the time i feel it but sometimes i like wow it's cool i'm reading in chinese and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah it's a uh, this rush, this, uh, this high, um, you, you feel good about yourself, but you, you have worked to the point where you can, uh, you, you can make your way through a whole page of, uh, page after page of characters. Uh, it's, uh, it's self affirming, self reaffirming. It makes you feel good about yourself. And, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's the, in the area of addiction, maybe it's, uh, I think to some degree it's healthy. I mean, it's, uh, it's you do, it's, it's a push to, but it, it keeps you going and it, 
I think in the, in, the, in the first place, it was, especially at the beginning, it was very important to have something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's how everything starts. And, and then little by little, you, you make your, your, your language ability grow. And, 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 and it's true that when you have this like little victory of, you know, just being able to order something in a restaurant or like being able to, to develop uh, into like maybe yeah, reading a few sentences, that that brings that brings a lot of joy and uh, and satisfaction and and then the, the, there is something else that i think uh, helped us a lot um how learning the language was um the fact that we we kind of started to have our own activities around the language and i remember that we both did this this podcast to talk about movies and uh, i was starting also to write uh, like little stories in mandarin for my homework and then I kind of like I like this kind of uh, exercise and stuff like that so can you maybe elaborate a bit on on this practice especially when you first start you know when you're not uh, confident in a language and you you kind of feel that there is a potential for like developing creativity and I remember like you at the very early stage I think you we were in this um, restaurant that is very near the, the school like uh, near the back door and you were writing a, a script in Chinese. I remember that. And you were telling me, yes, I'm starting writing scripts in Chinese. Can you maybe uh, tell us a bit more about like, how, di how did we manage to kind of like feel comfortable like being creative in Chinese? Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I could describe it as a buyao <laughs> lian. So as, as, uh, as long as you, <clears throat> as you're not ashamed of yourself <laughs> and uh, yeah to be as long as you're shameless then there's no obstacle to learning <laughs> any, any language <laughs> no but um, this is something i realized uh, looking back from my archives to, to, to write my book because i i looked back from my wechat post and i was like what the hell was i writing <laughs> in chinese <laughs> like things in Chinese that made no sense um, yeah really, really. <laughs> but I'm glad that I was doing it back then because I was using Chinese uh, the best way I could to express try to express myself and uh, I think this uh, either shamelessness or I, I, I would say also this blind confidence or blind optimism that you can do it <laughs> is actually very helpful when you're not so good yet <laughs> because it's uh there, there is i think it's it's frustrating there is that gap when uh you you start to know about the language but you are not there yet so you 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 realize maybe what what is what is a good text what is a good expression but you cannot do it so if sometimes you can just blind your eyes and do it anyway, the way you can, it's actually helpful because it makes you practice. And I'm grateful that I did the ways I can, I realized that were important for me. Yeah, it was posting on WeChat, just in Chinese, experimenting with doing some writing, writing some scripts and, and then uh, with uh, with our podcast with uh, which uh, I, I went back to listen to it uh, I think it was last year and I, I actually used the uh, was 1.5 or, or, or double the speed <laughs> to, to listen to it because I realized that who you are speaking at least me I was speaking pretty slowly so <laughs> you realize how how boring how boring uh, or how frustrating it must have been for a Chinese audience <laughs> to listen to these two Europeans. <laughs> but it was important for us to do it. Yeah, I think our audience was mostly our Chinese teachers and maybe a few good friends who were like patient enough to listen to us. <laughs> Yeah, only a few episodes went above uh, 100 uh, clicks. Most of them were like uh, 60 or something like that. 
Yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> I feel like everything, like all of these little stones actually also, yeah, ma made our, our Chinese better. And, and the reason why now we, we feel much better with the, with the language is also thanks to all these little episodes. Uh, moving towards the the big topic, which which is the film, the film section. Um, you were one of the only foreign student uh, learning in the directing program of Beijing Film Academy. Before we we go a bit deeper into like the the Chinese film industry and and all that stuff, can you maybe narrate uh, narrate a bit like how was your your journey uh, from you being just in a Chinese program to to actually become uh, one of the only uh, foreign people able to to follow classes with uh, with all these Chinese students. So as 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 I said, w one of the reasons that took me to China to study film was that I was already doing some film on my own, mostly short films that I would write and direct back then when I was uh, still in Italy. And once I arrived to China, I I kind of stopped this uh, all this for. Uh, at least one year, uh, I all of the late 2016 and all of 2017, I kind of went full time with Chinese learning. I didn't really do much to do with creati creativity. Even more than one year, I'd say maybe even two years. Yeah, because then the after one year of Chinese learning, I I had experimented a bit with. Uh, taking up some, some jobs uh, uh, here and there. I had uh, worked with a um, documentary channel at the CCTV for a series of documentaries on Italian culture and uh, also one on um, Chinese contemporary art. We went shooting around uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, Nanjing, a bunch of cities. Uh, but I, I realized that the work was not bringing me very far. Uh, it, they were with small gigs, but nothing very stable or substantial. So it was around uh, about one year into my life in China that I actually looking up at you somehow, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe Lino, maybe Val is not so wrong at uh, going ahead for the masters. Uh, maybe I, I should do it too, because uh, it's not working very well with jobs outside. And, and at that point, directing just seemed the the closest choice to me because uh, I was uh, I had already been doing a, a bit of that, uh, although kind of self-taught in uh, in Italy. And so when when I decided, it there was only there were only two months left, uh, two three months left before the examination. So I I started coming more often to class. Uh, the, we had was a uh, uh, film Chinese classes. Uh, the other uh, obstacle before uh, in the ap in the application uh, process was uh, actually to to find my um, tutor, right, uh, mentor, and uh, I. But that was something new to me because uh, I, yeah, this concept was quite new to me that that you had to like find a teacher to follow. Uh, felt very, very exotic, uh, ancient Chinese, uh, you, you're, you're master, but we'll show you the way. <laughs> so I, I actually asked help, uh, uh, I actually asked uh, Jean, our, our friend Jean, to, for, for help to, for, like, I, I had no idea who could, who would be my mentor, who would show me the light. I, I didn't know anyone in the school <laughs> of the teachers. And uh, I think this, this cultural difference, I, mean, I can talk about it more later, but this fact of the mentor was actually the most difficult part for me because it's uh, the, the dynamic between student and mentor. I think it's different than just between the one between professor and student in, uh, say, in our Western system. And I, I, found it, I found it difficult, complicated, and uh, it was a, a bit of an obstacle for me. But uh, I guess it was a, a, par a part of uh, learning also, yeah, the, the culture. But yeah, I, I found someone uh, uh, who willing to willing to be my light. And, uh, and then there was a, this a written and oral examinations, uh, the, uh, 
the, the, the oral test was, uh, I remember basically chatting in Chinese about uh, film and, you know, th th there were no right or wrong answers. I remember mostly like, who's your favorite director? Why do you like film? Why do you come to China? Which was a question we were being asked pretty often anyway. <laughs> and uh, and then the, the written exam, which I remember the, the hardest part was uh, to recognize the the Chinese names of important people in the West. So someone like Plato <laughs> or, uh, but <laughs> and I remember it was Plato that you mis mistook for pop art or, or, or something like Pollock, or, Jackson Pollock. Or, oh, for, for Jackson Pollock, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one is, one is Pola too and the other one is Paul, Paul, Paul Walker or something like that. So I think they share, they share at least two characters in common <laughs> yeah because the the content of the test was a, at least a, a, the kind of art history part was a uh, quite familiar for us coming from europe because a lot of it was like the re renaissance and um, all those uh, things we do in high school so the the difficult part was recognizing those names in chinese and <laughs> writing but, but yeah uh, i guess it it, it happened like that, uh, all, almost as, as quick as the decision to come to China, the one to uh, enroll in the master and go into the directing department. We were both entering these this Chinese uh, schools, like I, I was doing animation, you were doing directing, and I still have this vivid memory, and I think it was uh, September of 2019, when we received uh, this kind of like... Um, PDF that was shared on uh, on WeChat with all the the main guide guidelines that was uh, emitted by you know Chinese officials and and I think it came directly from the Chinese government and it was as uh, as precise as for example you know like oh you want to make a sci-fi movie or like a sci-fi short film okay here are the things that you you are not allowed to do uh, and I remember one f that kind of struck with me which was that if you are p portraying the future of China, uh, how, uh, no, 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 no matter how far it is in the future or like how distant it is, you will have to show the, the futuristic Communist Party that will still be kind of there. Mm, I see. Um, yeah, but from, from this point of view of the, um, I guess you could say the, the creative guidelines, things like that, I. I didn't feel it a lot inside school because I I, I never I never had the situation in which I, you know, uh, my mentor or someone was telling me don't shoot this or don't write this and uh, even it, in a, I have the um, the example of a, a classmate of my uh, my Chinese classmate he he shot a short film called uh, Zhen Chan Normal which is a um, it's actually a satire about Chinese politics, uh, but he was able to shoot it in school as a homework. And one of the things um, his professor told him, his mentor told him, I guess he, he, he was really mentoring him there. He said, uh, uh, once you get out of this school, you will, be, you will be saying a lot of lies, but first you need to learn to say the truth. So there, I, at least from this kind of uh, example, I, I found some uh, encouragement even for uh, free expression, at least within school. Uh, then if you, if you want to use even this short film, uh, my, my classmate, he, 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 had, he, he had more than one problem when trying to send it to film festivals in China. It, it, it wouldn't be easy, but as long as you are inside the school, at least back then in the directing department I lived, it was okay. I mean, I even had um, a classmate where his, uh, his graduation work was uh, about um, a friendship between um, two kids, one of uh, Han ethnicity and one of Uyghur ethnicity in a, in a Chinese city. So I think this is n not necessarily something that would go in Chinese theaters uh, all over the country. 
but as a as a graduation film in school it can work so yeah at, at, uh, just to answer your question at least from my experience and that of the people next to me i didn't experience in school you know the hand of the creative industry telling me what to do uh, at least not in school hmm. interesting yeah i i have to say like for me i didn't feel it either but i i was wondering if if maybe that was because of the the fact that you know be, being in the animation usually people will be maybe less suspicious and and i feel like with film especially with short film you you might be much more dangerous and much more direct in like criticizing some stuff or like or like maybe talking about very sensitive stuff but i i definitely agree with you in the sense that i felt like these years in in beijing film academy they were very free like we we were allowed to go to any classes almost like we could show up to any classes even though they were not part of our program um and yeah everyone will be like free to talk to each other there were, there were no such things as as a uh, censorship i felt yeah school school is the um and that's maybe the the sad thing for uh uh young artists young filmmakers in china that school is the last place where you really have freedom of expression and then after that it becomes difficult uh, once you are in the industry it becomes difficult to to continue that and that's why that many you have so many talented chinese filmmakers but they end up relying on european film festivals for their career because they 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 cannot really develop uh, further in china they, and they are in this in this weird position because yeah i don't know if you can just survive on film festivals only if you can i think but yeah just to 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 kind of like um, further extend on on this on this topic is like i i remember that when we when we left uh, when i left china uh, the the movie industry <coughs> was maybe not booming because it it didn't happen like overnight but i would say that overall it was in a pretty good shape in a sense that many things uh, were going on at the time can you maybe tell us a bit more about your views on 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 the chinese film industry nowadays compared to what it was in before covid yeah uh, to to me the the most uh, striking uh, uh, contrast between uh, now uh, well, i would say the post covid with the pre covid years is a uh, i can see it in uh, the year of 2018 because in 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 that, in that year it, it's also the year in which we recorded our podcast on, on Chinese film and it's uh, it's probably the year I went to the theater uh, the most in China and uh, uh, there there was uh, the um, in the summer I remember there was the 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 shop shop shoplifters screening in uh, Chinese movie theaters in uh, I think it was in July the, the summer anyway there were some uh, I think it was a Ready Player One, some some big American movies also scoring very high box offices. Uh, um, there were that year a bunch of uh, uh, new films for big Chinese directors. Uh, with, uh, I think it was a Xie Bu Ya Zheng by Jiang Wen and um, and a few more probably uh, Jiang Hu Arno, Jia Zhang Ke. Um, it was a, a very rich year for both. Uh, uh, foreign films getting into China and scoring high box offices and for uh, Chinese films both with these uh, um, big big name directors and some new ones uh, uh, coming out with uh, especially with the genre I think it was a, a, a big year for uh, for genre those are the Wobusha Yao Sheng about this uh, this guy trafficking medicines to save some people's lives um, so I, I i found it i experienced it as a very rich year in chinese theaters for the choice 
the what was foreign, what was local, what was uh, old, classic, and what was uh, young and new. Uh, I find it very stimulating, uh, together with the, the fact that there was maybe maybe the money that was uh, running in the business, maybe it was at its highest. Uh, or it, the, there was quite a lot of investment. It's uh, the, uh, the years in which, if you talk to some uh, Chinese now, they, they, they will tell you that back then anyone could get money to, to do a project. The, the investment was done very uh, easily. <laughs> And without too much thought, we, it would be much more difficult to, to, to collect money, to, to collect funding now. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this 2018, I, I would compare it with uh, the, the post-COVID era in which, um, well, film, films like the Chan Jin Hu became um, so very basically state propaganda movies, be, became the absolute winners in terms of box office. And uh, uh, at a time after 2020, when uh, so many film companies shut down and uh, many, many others found it hard to survive, it was uh, this type of uh, state propaganda production that had the most resources and power to to keep going and, and to even expand. And so I, uh, I mean, not just me, there have been, there have been critics that have observed is how the, the kind of talent that uh, was uh, developed uh, in, uh, in Chinese filmmakers uh, after the 2000s uh, with the directors that learned how to make, uh, you know, comedies, dramas uh, and genres by gradually, but by 2020, it had become a, a reality. We're starting to be to be a, a more a very active part of the state sponsor movies, and so the 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 market the market part um, the free market part of the film industry became weaker, and uh, even I mean even. Directors like uh, um, Xu Ke were were on uh, Chan Jin Hu. On uh, so that meant that if you wanted to do your job, even as a very big name, you had to work on state productions for one reason or the other. And that's something that honestly I didn't expect when we were learn when we were uh, discovering the Chinese film industry in 2018, even 2019, it looked very, very much going towards a direction of uh, more diversity in content. And now you may still see this diversity, but if you look hard, it's actually very standardized. <clears throat> it's, uh, you will see different genres because that's the point of developing these talents that can shoot, you know, a comedy, a drama, and uh, all these different genres, but all in a way that is uh, acceptable and desirable for uh, who the, the, the state uh, production behind. So you, you will see less uh, very hard, uh, realist uh, takes on the society. And uh, I think uh, what is... Uh, um, there's something that feels a, a bit weird uh, in uh, the, I think I was saying the sound of the post-COVID uh, Chinese blockbusters is that you see this, uh, this the plot is pushing hard to to make you feel good about the characters and to to make you feel optimist in the end to to, to, leave, to leave you with a hint of positivity. And uh, I think this is the note that is basically the price to pay if you want to be in the industry right now. I, I was wondering if you could also tell us a bit more of um, the, the difficult uh, days that you had to spend uh, stuck in school 
which was basically, um, if I remember correctly, from February 2020 to the moment that you, you got out. Uh, that's that's basically the moment when I left. Uh, I left a few, yeah, 2020. Yeah, I left a few weeks after COVID happened, so it it kind of officially happened in beginning of January in Wuhan, and then we we were both stuck in 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 the dorms in the Beijing Film Academy inside the dorms, but you stayed much longer, and I think you were one of the only foreign students. I, even when I left, we were kind of the only person left there because most of the local students had went back to their um, to their hometown for the Chinese uh, Chinese New Year. Uh, yeah, can you maybe tell us a bit more about how you how you how you felt during that that time? Yeah, uh, so um, first a, a little bit of background. I uh, it was COVID that just started uh, the school. Uh, Put up a series of regulations, uh, but essentially you couldn't go out. You, you to to go out, you had to apply, and uh, at least at the beginning, it was only you could only go out for only two hours with a permit, things like that. And uh, back then, uh, I could leave, like you left and other people's left, but the 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 reason I stayed inside school is that I. I didn't have a job. I was a student, and uh, uh, if I went outside, I would have to start to pay rent, and uh, I, w I just didn't know how I would have make it work. So I decided to to, to stay in school for uh, the foreseeable future, and it was this uh, this kind of fight ag run against the time because. Uh, I was always hoping that um, you know all these regulations would end at one point. So I uh, I, I kind of uh, resisted in February, you know, I was uh, holding on, and I think well, in February it was actually kind of normal because all of the all of China was under lockdowns to some extent, so it, it didn't even feel too strange. But then around March, when the rest of the, uh, Beijing uh, kind of went back to normal. And people were going to work. I mean, I, I could see them from the school. Uh, this, the school was still closed. So at, at that point was when it was becoming quite isolating and uh, and sad to be there. And uh, yeah, I it it stimulated my writing, my Chinese writing, because my my Chinese writing basically started there when I was stuck in school and I. Uh, I would see very few people. Uh, just the, say the the shu shu, the wei xiu, wei xiu da shu, uh, the guy, the the old the guy doing the reparations in the inside the dorms, and he, he was one of the guys was there, or uh, the lady uh, cleaning the dorms. Um, and so this very. Uh, small bits of conversation I would have with them. I started writing them down because they, they were actually all the social life I had <laughs> inside there. So I started, uh, I mean, appreciating them and uh, trying to enjoy them, uh, to be, to find some humanity in the in this small world <laughs> that had become the school. And uh, yeah, so that, that was the. The silver lining of those uh, five months inside school, uh, basically without going out, uh, only with a few permits every now and then. And then in a, there, there was a trend of things getting better, but then the things things changed in June because uh, the, there was a, a new uh, a, a new bunch of cases in uh, in a market uh, in a market in Beijing, and. Uh, things just got back to the emergency status as before. So no one out. And uh, that was a, a big hit for me psychologically because, uh, you know, in my mind, uh, I had this picture of things getting better and better by the, by the day, by the week, by the month, and then suddenly you're back to zero. <laughs> and, and so I, at that point is when I realized that my mind was not holding it anymore. Uh, I, I was not 
in conditions to do even one more day of that. So it's the it's the coincidence, but I I, I managed to find um, um, an Italian friend who was stuck outside of China, uh, who was still renting a house in Beijing. So I, I just went to stay in his house for uh, for a while, for uh, a couple months, two three months, uh, for free. Uh, so that, that was uh, I, I had this uh, help that gave me the, um, the confidence to, to say, okay, I will go out. Uh, and uh, I remember it was uh, the middle of June and uh, at school they told me, uh, make sure you have the, the means, you know, the, to, to survive one, at least 100 days outside of school, <laughs> like a mission. And uh, uh, it's a, uh, because that was the deal with leaving school, that if you left school, you didn't know when you could come back. So, so, so that, that was one of the reasons why I, I never had the, the guts to, to make that call. But I made that call when I couldn't take it anymore. And they said, yeah, 100 days. And the reality is I never went back. Because <laughs> for, for two reasons. One is I, I, luckily I managed to build my life outside of school. And two, these, uh, all these regulations, to some extent, and mm, sometimes improving and sometimes getting worse, they continued for a very long time. I, I went back to school in, uh, it was the June of, basically one year after, uh, late June of, tw June of 2021. So uh, not 100 days. One, one year after, I, I went back to pick my things up. Because they told me, uh, yeah, Lee, come get your things. <laughs> and I said, okay. But I went inside the school and I met again with the, with the Shushu, you know, in the, doing the repairs. And I asked him, can you go out now? And he said, no. So you, you can imagine it, it means that he was already inside school for one and a half years the experience of, of being stuck inside school for five months left me, I think it left me a scar, <laughs> but may, it left me a, a very strong desire to just, to go around, just, <laughs> to just be on the move. <laughs> and, and so in the, after that, I basically always kept moving. And uh, I, I was in yeah in my in my friend's apartment for a couple months to get my kind of get my life together. But in in August, I received a call, a very random uh, invitation to go to Qingdao and uh, teach Italian in a high school there. For a, uh, the offer was for one month, and uh, I only thought about it very little, and then I went. Because I was like, why not? Yeah, just go explore, just go breathe uh, by, 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 the, by the sea <laughs> after all these months in Beijing, especially in, inside the school. Uh, I just had this desire to, to, to move. And, uh, and then I, I, after that, I did a bit of traveling in the, in the summer and then I moved to Shanghai. In, uh, and then in Shanghai, I, I finally found after basically after one and a half year of COVID, um, some no normality and stability to my life. Um, I started doing some teaching, doing some advertisement, shooting, some, uh, I, I set up a, a writing club, like a bunch of friends sharing, bunch of, um, a, a bunch of strangers actually, um, meeting up and sharing, e uh, what, whatever we wrote, sharing our writing. So it was a, a very, I would say, very wholesome time in, in Shanghai and uh, finding this, uh, some regularity, some routine to my life again, which I, I, I missed. And that, that lasted for uh, like six months until uh, COVID in Shanghai in 2022. <laughs> so then uh, I, I, I live, I, I went through those two, those famous two months. And then I mean, if you, if you notice it in, 
in my recounting of those time, it's like a cycle, like things repeating themselves. It's like you get stuck, then you go out, then you get stuck again, then you go out. Uh, and it was the same uh, in 2022, stuck in two, for two months in Shanghai. And then uh, I left, went to Hainan, and I got stuck there as well. <laughs> there was a lockdowns there too. And uh, 2022 was a very strange year because uh, it, it, I would say it was the most complica complicated year in terms of regulations. It was very difficult to go from one city to the other, all these regulations as for whether you could go or not, what happened if you go there, will you have to do quarantine, things like that. So the uh, 2022, after I left Shanghai, the second half of 2022 was also a, basically a time that where I had no home, like uh, two weeks here, two weeks there, the longest, maybe one month in one place. Uh, and all of this continued until, uh, until I left China in uh, February of 2023. And since then, it's been one year, but uh, I've been just traveling around. And uh, I, I, mostly in Southeast Asia, but I, yeah, I went back to Italy finally for the first time after four years uh, in China. And um, yeah, now I'm, uh, yeah, basically traveling and writing. Do you think that this, this this decision to become uh, what you call in in Chinese nomadic writer, do you think that this decision happened when you when you started this uh, this writing group in Shanghai, or do you recall like any specific moment in time when when it clicked? It's some um, well, these two elements coming to med together, like the the nomadic part, nomadic part and the writing part. So the the writing part came first. Because the, the writing part, it, well, writing was always a part of my life since I was a kid. I, uh, I always li liked writing. But um, after I, I did it for work uh, as a journalist in my like, early 20s, I then set it aside to do film. So then uh, for a few years, it was not so central in my life anymore. Basically until 2020, when inside school I picked up, I started writing in Chinese again. Well, for the first time. Uh, and uh, at that point, writing was, I, I wouldn't say back to the center of my life, but it started to play a role in my life again. And in uh, and that continued in 2021 in Shanghai with this writing club. Uh, so just connecting with the strangers and people around me through writing that made me happy. And all this, he, he, he gave me the, um, well, I, um, I, I had the, the sense that I, I wanted to do something I liked. So I, I gave up the job I was doing back then, which was teaching Italian. In, uh, was in the, I did this in February 2022. And I, I started, I, I thought I will, I will just go freelance with things like, you know, tra translations, things like that. Uh, not necessarily my creative writing, but at least I can go freelance and then do something creative on the side. That was my idea. But I only did it for one month and then the Shanghai lockdown started. And after the Shanghai lockdown started, something interesting happened, which is I didn't want to work anymore. <laughs> and uh, I, I really, I lost any interest in all sorts of commercial works um, like paid paid jobs, paid gigs, uh, freelance gigs. I didn't want to do that. So I, I felt so alienated from the life that was outside my apartment, the life I couldn't see. Um, but I was only interested in trying to learn about what was happening, why why we were stuck in our, in our homes. And uh, I did some writing, I, I wrote a piece but at the beginning it was just a diary on, it was just a, like a blog, a blog entry on my Chinese blogs back then. Uh, but then I, I actually used it to take part in a, in a writing contest um, held by the, 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 the media called the, the Sixth Tone. 
the sixth song. So, so I, I actually wrote an English version of it. I translated it into English to to compete in, to take part in this competition, and it won. So that was a uh, uh, that was good both financially and uh, I would say confidence wise, because uh, um, also during during those two months I had. Uh, uh, through a Chinese friend uh, in Europe, I managed to write uh, some, like one reportage from Shanghai, from from my apartment, <laughs> because I couldn't go out. <laughs> uh, it was for a for a magazine in uh, Switzerland. In, uh, it came out in German. I, I wrote it in English. They translated it into German. But, so this uh, this writing, this uh, the price only came in August, but uh, this. Uh, writing gigs and the uh, writing price it gave me some uh, together with the desire to do something meaningful because i think after the shanghai lockdown started i i lost the ability basically to to do something that didn't doesn't interest me or that i uh, in which i don't see some value some social or human value I, it 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 happened really strongly like I, I couldn't do anything else anymore. I could only write about what was happening. Uh, it was very radical. So I would say this uh, this push towards more uh, uh, meaningful work and some of the recognition that my writing received, um, it gave me the confidence to uh, decide that it could be my career. But I, I, I could just go with it, and so in the in in, in the summer uh, I decided to uh, write with more regularity. I put up a newsletter uh, that I updated every basically every other week. Um, I wrote one one more piece for that magazine in Switzerland. So things were starting rolling, and uh, then in uh, in December there was a uh, this. Um, this online magazine, Jamian uh, Liandie, that uh, contacted me, asking me to write my story. They are a they are a long form uh, non fiction platform. So I, I I wrote this story, which uh, like they asked me, uh, can you write your story with China? And I was like, wait, <laughs> that's a bit of a long story. <laughs> I have no idea where to start, and uh, uh, my panic at the beginning was that. What did I do all these years? Like, because uh, <laughs> uh, now that I went back and uh, went through all these memories and kind of reorganized them, I built some structure about these these years. But the first time that this magazine contacted me, asking me to write my story of these six years, I was very confused because <laughs> very very hazy. Like, oh, like w what happened in 2019 and what happened in 2017 and what, like just very confused and and I was afraid of the of coming to the conclusion that in these six years I didn't do anything, um, <laughs> uh, but but that was good because it it, uh, uh, it pushed me to write this very long piece autobi autobiographical piece, but uh, when it came out on WeChat it got a it got a lot of reads and uh, it, it went past 100,000 reads in only a few days. And uh, the same day it came out, I had a publishing house contacting me, asking me to if I were interested in writing a book. Uh, basic, basically a, a longer version of that article. Because that, that article, since uh, it's, it's an online article, so it, um, I, I could only write so much, but actually it's very condensed. Because you, you have to fit six years into it. The, even if I look back, if if I look back to it, uh, I feel like it's it's kind of weird because I start talking about something and then I like, cut to the next, cut to the next. Uh, I, I from me who I experience it, I feel it a bit choppy. So uh, I I'm happy, but then the opportunity came to write a book, and so. Uh, that that happened in uh, December of 2022, and something also happened in December 22, which is the 
the COVID era in China ended. So finally, um, it all finished from one day to the next. Like the day before, if you had COVID, you, you were still sent to a quarantine facility. And then the next day, the, the regulation was that if you had COVID, you could still go to work. So that was uh, from one day to the other, uh, the, the change. And uh, what, what happened then was that uh, uh, both, both me and my, my girlfriend then, we, we had lived these three years of a very strange life inside China, um, especially 2022. And we, I think we, we both wanted to go back and see the world outside. So we, we spent the, um, the Chinese New Year in China, but then in, uh, as soon as the Chinese New Year ended in February, we just made a plan to, to go to Thailand. And the, one, one of the push for it was that I had to write this book. And so I, I could do it from anywhere. I, I, I had achieved this uh, location, location independence with freedom to, to work from anywhere. So it, it, it's kind of all these uh, things clicking together, like the COVID era ended, this book deal came in, um, let's go travel and write, which sounded also romantic. And I, it is sometimes, it is, uh, it is difficult uh, other times, uh, but uh, I, I didn't have in mind that it, it would become my life. Um, so I, I was not sure how long it would last. It, it, it only felt like uh, almost like a physiological need to go outside and go somewhere else just to see something different and brief, brief something, brief different air after you've been there for three years. Um, four for me, if I include one year before COVID. So yeah, it, it, that brought in the nomadic part of it because uh, uh, now with my partner, we, I think we, we are both interested in uh, uh, just exploring more and um, somehow also to get out of a China-centric view of the world. And so to, because uh, I think that, that's also something that happened to me by living in China for many years, but you, you tend to feel like China is the world or at least the center of it. It's something that, that's very deep rooted in, uh, in, in all things China. And uh, it, it, it got also in my brain and uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I want to be, uh, I mean, that was my kind of my 20 year old, my, my 20 year old vision, my vision as a young, naive 20 year old to be a global citizen. And, uh, and that, that was one of my um, very positive feelings uh, when coming to China for the first time uh, at the Youth Olympic Games in 2014 to, to meet uh, the volunteers. There were, these, uh, there were university students from Nanjing uh, working as volunteers uh, during the Youth Olympic Games and just speaking in English with them and uh, having this feeling that uh, as young people from different parts of the world, we are the same. And um, I know, I, I realized that it, it, it was a, a naive uh, perception, but there, there was something very precious to it that uh, attracted me. And uh, I think I, that I pursued later on, even through my writing, to pursue this uh, common humanity we have. And uh, that uh, although we have differences and uh, I, I agree that uh, even as a white man in China, you will always be different. There, there, there's, no, there's no way to change that. But, but, but still, I believe that you can still make meaningful connections by finding that common humanity. And um, 
the fact that you you got uh, you were contacted by this Chinese publishing company and then you had I, I assume you had this period of time to to complete the the first draft can you maybe tell us a bit more on, on you know how you organized yourself and how it was like all this interaction between them and you did you did you discover something that you were not expecting yeah uh, I, I can sum up <clears throat> the the process uh, so the when they when they approached me uh, when the publishing house approached me they had read this article my basically my short autobiography about my years in China so that was very helpful uh, because it already had a structure to the story so basically they they called me and they already had an idea for what the narrative of the book would be so so that saved a lot of time at the beginning and uh, basically we already had the table of contents we we I could say it like this and and so we af after that uh, together with signing the contract the only thing we really decided in advance was this table of contents um, at least in not necessarily the order of them but at least uh, like the themes and the the time periods and the yeah the uh, that I would cover and so once we had this agreement um, the next step was just to s me starting writing and then the and just sending them a chapter uh, like chapter by chapter and they they would give me well before I started writing I had to <clears throat> organize my work and that was like the uh, the boring <laughs> uh back end archive works because uh once i once i had uh, i i had done a little bit of that to write that article for that magazine but i needed more for the book so i uh, i went through digital and uh, real life archives so both things and uh online uh, records uh, like uh, social media posts uh, and uh, pictures from my phones, uh, pictures were very helpful. And I just uh, categorized basically all pictures and all uh, diaries I could find, uh, e even like uh, uh, a small card from a restaurant, even you know, like uh, things from daily life, uh, even a letter you wrote to me. <laughs> and uh, all these, because I, I kept a lot. I, I kept a lot of these things from the years. So I, categorize them by year and um, so I, I had all this archive and um, once I had that basically I started <clears throat> so I started writing uh, maybe, maybe the interesting thing is that uh, the book is divided in half uh, before 2020 and after 2020 and uh, I started writing I started writing the book from the second half and um, so the the post covid era uh, and, and and the reason to me was uh, because it was fresh in my mind I I had just lived it it had just finished and I had a lot of uh, emotions that were still relatively fresh that I could uh, just put on, put on the page and uh, and uh, so it felt natural to start from the second part of the part that was closer to me because the the years before covid uh, they um, back then but also now they feel like a different me uh, if it makes sense like it's uh, after even within the years of china the <clears throat> the years after covid were radically different uh, even for the people around me uh, like you left uh, all, all dom left all the people that were my my best friends basically they left and, uh, and, and so i i recreated a life uh, even far from beijing um, after covid and uh, whereas the times before covid also because so much changed in the life in China uh, they just felt 
almost like a different life like uh, from someone else and uh, and of course there's also the reason of time that so much time has passed that it's uh, it, it becomes difficult to look at something you posted uh, six years ago and to and to remember what was your state of mind it's a uh, it's difficult to capture that same state of mind and, uh, and so that was the the difficult part of writing the first part of the book the one that was further away in time but uh, yeah so i didn't have this problem for the second part so i thought while it's still fresh i will first write it and then i will think about the, the first part and do you have any timeline like sense of timeline on when this this book is going to come out uh, that's the that's the question that is uh, is making me is taking my sleep away these this, this days <laughs> um, ba basically no one knows and i last year i I, I wrote this book basically from March of August, from March to August of last year. It took me about five months. And um, then I, I sent it in to the publishing house and all this process of editing started. Uh, there were uh, uh, a good few months where I didn't know anything. I was just waiting for feedback. And um, eventually we went back and forth with uh, some, some pretty generic, uh, uh, advice to more specific ones and um, to make it short at the end of it we we arrived to a final product that we were both happy with uh, in January of this year so the so the editing lasted uh, from August to January about uh, four or five months a, a, a bit less than the writing so writing plus editing was like uh, nine months like like a baby and, uh, but a a after that, uh, there was the, the Chinese New Year holiday. So things were uh, still for like one month almost. And then in February, we, the, the publishing house sent it in for uh, approval. <laughs> so that, that's where the difficult part starts and that's where we have no control over it. And, uh, and that's where the the so-called uh, suggestions for edits may come and uh, and these are the suggestions that are uh, are not really about style but but about uh, whether your content is uh, sensitive or not so we are uh, we are waiting and uh, this uh, this constant waiting is is quite heavy for me um, but uh, yeah the if 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 I want to publish in China, it's uh, this is a um, something I have to go through. So it's uh, the, the the process is that to to make an example, if uh, if I receive a negative feedback, there, there are three kinds of feedback I can receive. the The best one is they say there's no problem. Uh, the second one, the second best one is they have some. Uh, specific suggestions so say can you make these changes and the the worst one is uh no <laughs> so if uh if it is no then we it means that we we can still make an attempt with someone else so be, be, be the the peculiar thing about publishing in china is that there are uh, two publishing houses involved so the, there is uh, one that is the one uh, who re reached out to me in the first place and with which I, I worked throughout this year. They are a company, basically, like a private company. But then if you want to publish a book in China, it needs a, uh, basically an ISBN, like a, a book code, but only a state uh, publishing house g can give. And the, the state publishing house, they are they are not so much in the business of content like they are usually they are not creating the content they are approving it they they are they are just uh, giving basically giving you the stamp and, and and that's why on a chinese book you will see the names of two 
two publishing houses. Uh, like in, in, in Chinese, they have different names. One is Chuban Gongsi, one is Chuban Shi. Now we reached out to one uh, Chuban Shi, uh, to, to, to one publishing house uh, for approval. And uh, if I receive a negative feedback, then we can try with another one. Uh, the, there, are, uh, there are a bunch of them. Uh, hopefully, at, at, well, it will go well with at least at least one, and uh, and we'll see. But uh, yeah, it's uh, at at this point. But even the even my by now, I mean, almost friends at the at the Chubangons, uh, the publishing house I work with, it's where they also don't know. I mean, because uh, how long will you have to wait? You don't know. What what, what are the rules? You don't know. There, there are there are no clear rules for this. So the you are playing in the dark, and that's what's most uh, frustrating. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's not easy to pu to publish a book in China. But uh, I'm uh, uh, I think uh, what I wrote these stories, the stories from these years, I would love to share them with the people where I had these experiences. Um, so I, I know that I can publish this book in Europe, uh, in the United States. Uh, I, I can do that anytime. Uh, but first, I hope I can do it in China. Uh, we will see if that's possible. I know that this is out of my control. So what I can do, I already did, which was writing the book. And the rest, uh, unfortunately, I, I cannot do it. Uh, it's out of my control. So we, we will see. We'll see. And, and for the people who cannot read Chinese and who would be interested to know your stories and, and discover your writings. So I decided to, to start my Substack for uh, my articles in English and Italian. Um, I can send you the link after and maybe you can post, put it in the description of this video. And, and also I would like to recommend the, the lecture of your, of your article on six tone because this one is is really is really worth reading and um, as well as all the other articles from six tone which is like a very very great uh, platform um then i think uh, yeah i think we can uh, we can wrap up maybe i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording and then we can uh, uh yeah we i will i will let you go go back to a i hopefully a, a good night of sleep um but yeah just to just to finish the um, the recording part i i wish you all the all the best with the the book publishing i i hope it uh, it comes out uh, soon for for all the the chinese uh, writers who are following you i know that you're getting a lot of uh, comments and uh, and uh, and appreciation uh, whenever you you publish something so it's it's always something also that maybe if we have a, if we have some time we could discuss um, further but uh, but I find it super great, you know, uh, I, I, I have kind of the same experience, but I feel like there is a lot of positivity and, uh, and, and great feedback that you, that you have from, uh, from Chinese audience. So, so hopefully the book will, will have the same success and, uh, and you will get also to, to share in the future, like an English version of it. Thanks, Valen. All the best for your move to Vancouver. Merci pour votre temps. Et si vous avez encore quelques secondes à m'accorder, Pensez à mettre une note étoilée à ce podcast. Bonne fin de journée à toutes et à tous et à bientôt pour un nouvel épisode.